words and as you uh, get ready to fill out those blanks, we are looking at the third candle, the candle of joy. And uh, for a title, I have chosen words from a very familiar hymn, Joy to the World, uh, which, by the way, is uh, actually based on Psalm 84. And uh, one of the lines goes like this, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. So today we rejoice that the Lord was born, and uh, by his birth, he has brought joy into the world. Now, I was actually staggered by this statistic that the word joy occurs over 650 times in the Bible. It comes as joy, rejoice, rejoicing, glad, gladness, delight. And it's very obvious the Bible is a book of joy because our God is a God of joy. And God wants his people to be a people of joy. So let's uh, track the <laughs> word joy in the Christmas story. I've given you all the references. Zechariah was told by the angel, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. So in one statement, three times you have the word joy. The birth of John the Baptist was going to just bring incredible joy to the whole nation. John the Baptist leaped for joy in his mother's womb, Luke 1.44. And then Mary, when she got the wonderful uh, good news that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, she burst out into a song of praise. And one of the first lines, uh, uh, it says, Mary rejoiced. In God, her Savior, she rejoiced. Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives rejoice with her that uh, an old woman who was barren all her life was now going to give birth to a child, a miracle child. And then, of course, the angelic proclamation to the, uh, to the shepherds, glad tidings of great joy, glad tidings of great joy. And the Magi, the wise men, they were overjoyed at seeing the star that eventually led them to the house where the Lord Jesus lay. So the Christmas story is all full of joy. How about the Christmas carols? So let's just highlight three. In the carol, O Holy Night, there is a line that goes like this. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. And then the very familiar carol, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Joyful and triumphant. And then of course, joy to the world, the Lord is come, <coughs> let earth receive her king. So it's all over the Bible, joy. So we need to give a definition of this word joy. And uh, I don't think you can come across a better definition than the definition that is listed for you, uh, which is from a very popular pastor. And uh, <coughs> I want to read it once. I'm going to ask you to underline three phrases because you can break it down into three components. Okay? Joy is the settled assurance. I want you to underline settled assurance. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. Man, you can put a period right there and you can just burst out into joy. Just that one, one statement alone. The quiet confidence, so underline quiet confidence, that ultimately everything is going to be all right. Wow. Joy is the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And the third component, and the determined choice, so underline determined choice, that's your responsibility and my responsibility. The determined choice to praise God in every situation. So today when your wife has put extra salt in your food, you are still called to 
Ramit. Ah, oh, to thank the Lord. Right? Good thing you're sitting separately. You might have got a nudge. But uh, now I want the whole church to read that definition together. Okay? It's a very beautiful definition. And let's speak it out together. Here we go. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. So later on today, I want you to take your pen and write this definition somewhere in your Bible, because joy is in short supply today. And we want to reflect to the world that we are supremely a joyful people because we have a joyful God. <clears throat> now I'm going to walk you through uh, 10 statements from scripture that all relate to joy. And basically, most of these verses are going to tell us how we can cultivate joy in our life. How do we cultivate joy in our life? So that's the sermon today, uh, points 1 to 10. So number one, we have to start where we should start, the source of joy. <coughs> the source of joy. Where does joy come from? The origin of all joy. So I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and you're going to turn with me to some of these scriptures. Psalm 43 and verse 4. And as you turn, these are some great verses to underline. Psalm 43 and verse 4. So here is David. Uh, Psalm 42 and 43 are very commonly called depression psalms. When you are really depressed, these are two good psalms to read because it not only talks about the depression but how to come out of it. Right? So Psalm uh, 43 and verse 4 says, 43 and verse 4, Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I want you to underline that phrase. To God my joy and my delight. So here we are talking about God the Father. God the Father is a supremely joyful being, right? Now, I have shown you this verse before, but well worth repeating, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. So, we might have a little struggle finding Zephaniah. I am having struggle finding it. I know it's somewhere in the Bible, right? It's between Haggai and Habakkuk, if that helps. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. Okay, what a mighty verse this is. Uh, to set you rejoicing, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What an incredible verse. Right? So, to put it in a very blunt colloquial language, God is madly in love with you. Right? No, I thought you would have said amen. Very weak and very late. God is madly in love with you. He's so in love with you, he's constantly singing songs over you. What, what it reminds me of, Ramit, is, you know, when you first met your wife, how you and I would sing songs, right? And, uh, right, just to woo her, to attract her, and then, of course, the songs die a natural death. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what the movies are all about, right? Okay. Uh, but God never stops singing songs over you. Isn't that incredible? Right? So God the Father is joyful. So joyful that he is singing songs over you. Now how about God the Son? So turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 
10, and we are going to look at verse 21. Luke 10, 21. And the first part of that verse says, At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, full of joy. So there you have the second person in the Godhead, the Lord Jesus, again, supremely joyful. Now, the third person of the Godhead is God the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians 5.22, we are told the fruit of the Spirit is joy. So there you have it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all supremely joyful beings. And when we come into relationship with the triune God, we should have triple joy. <laughs> Church, did you hear that? We should have triple joy. But look at the average Christian. Do they reflect triple joy? Right. That's a very honest answer. We don't. And we are going to find reasons how we can have that triple joy. Now, number two, salvation joy. We looked at the source of joy. Now we need to look at salvation joy. And again, a, an absolutely amazing scripture, Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Isaiah 61 and verse 10. 10. And uh, some of these verses might be new to you, but uh, I hope the Holy Spirit will bring it with clarity and freshness to our hearts. Isaiah 61.10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in God, uh, in my God. So did you notice those words? Delight and rejoice. So when you come into relationship with the Lord, you will have joy and delight. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Because God in his great grace and mercy has given me the robe of righteousness to cover all my sin and my shame and my guilt. It's all gone. And now I stand justified in the presence of God, acquitted of all my sins, because all my sins were taken at the cross by the Lord Jesus. What incredible good news. So the joy of salvation. Now, King David, who committed sin grievously, uh, penned these words as uh, words of repentance. So maybe some of us may need to pray this this morning. Uh, Psalm 51 and verse 12. Psalm 51 and verse 12. Restore to me the joy of salvation. Maybe you're claiming, yes, I have a relationship with God, but somewhere along the road I lost my joy. I don't know why. Usually it's sin issues in our life. But when we get back to the Lord, when we repent, and when we humbly ask the Lord to forgive us, the joy is restored. So salvation is marked by joy. I have told you this before, but it bears repetition. Uh, C.S. Lewis, when he got converted, he wrote a book talking about his conversion experience, and he titled the book Surprised by Joy. And C.S. Lewis went on to write, Joy is the serious business of heaven. I love that statement. Joy is the serious business of heaven. So if I'm not a joyful person now, then I've got to ask some questions. Why? Why not? Now we come to number three. <laughs> Songs of joy. Right? So God is the originator of joy. At salvation I receive joy. And I begin to express this joy through songs. That's why songs are so important and so popular and so necessary. A very beautiful way of expressing our joy. So uh, let's look at a couple of verses. Psalm 100 and verse 2. And verse 2. And uh, it says uh, in the... Uh, let me read the whole verse. Uh, actually, let me read from verse 1. Verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord, 
all the earth. So I want you to underline the word shout. Just like how when your team wins a game and you, you go ballistic, you are so joyful, you are so happy, you are shouting, you are screaming, you are yelling, right? Till your voice goes hoarse. Uh, that's the picture. Shout for joy at the salvation God has given us. And verse 2, worship the Lord with gladness. Again the word joy. Our worship should be exuberant worship. Of course, there is a solemnity to our worship because God is holy and we come reverent before him. But also, the other side of the coin is that we are exuberant in God's presence, right? Worship the Lord with gladness, right? Come before him with joyful songs. I think this week I sent many of you an email talking about worship. And how it's not just individual worship, it's corporate worship. And when your corporate worship is going to encourage somebody else. I, I received some incredible feedback uh, on that article. And if you haven't read it, please do yourself a favor. When you go home today, read that article. Very well written about what worship is all about. Right? It's not about you. It's all about the Lord and fellow believers. When you worship, somebody else is going to be inspired by what you sing. So, uh, come before his presence with joyful songs. And then if you flip a few pages to Psalm 107, Psalm 107 and verse 22, verse 22. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. So evangelism can be in the form of songs. Did you know that? So that's why you take, uh, the, for example, the Billy Graham Crusades. There's a lot of singing before Billy Graham uh, comes to uh, proclaim the gospel. Uh, there is a solo before Billy Graham sings, usually George Beverly Shea. And in that song is the message of salvation, right? Right? So if you say, you know, I'm really tongue-tied when it comes to sharing my faith, how about singing a song? So one of my very first uh, mentors was Dr. Sam Kamalesan. Uh, he was the pastor of uh, Emmanuel Methodist Church uh, in Madras, India. And uh, he, uh, he said when he got converted, he wanted to share the gospel, but he was really scared. But he could sing beautifully. Even today when you say Dr. Sam Kamalesan, everyone craves for his songs. So he uh, took his uh, shopping bag and he went to the local market and he put the shopping bag between his two legs and he closed his eyes because he was so scared and he started singing. He started singing gospel songs and he opened his eyes to look and he got the shock of his life. There was a huge crowd standing in front of him. He wanted to run and they all said, keep singing, keep singing. And uh, so Dr. Kamalesan became a very popular evangelist, primarily through his singing ministry. He's a great orator, great speaker. But uh, it was through the songs that uh, people came to know the Lord. So, would encourage you to do that. Now, number three, scripture joy. Scripture joy. So, turn to Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. How do you know that you have spent time alone with the Lord in his word. How do you know? How do you know that it has become effective? Here, here is the answer. Jeremiah 15 and verse 16. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Now, you might feel uncomfortable uh, with that word ate. So, Jeremiah is not advocating literal eating. I'm not asking you to tear the Bible page and eat it, right? The word eat there simply means meditate. God, your words came to me and I took time to meditate, to think it through, to internalize it. And when I internalized it, I became a supremely joyful person. Beloved, you can't spend time alone in God's word and still have a long face. Something wrong. 
because the word of god has a way of causing us to come alive to come alive in the lord right so for me it's a real joy right through the week i'm in the word i'm preparing i'm thinking through scriptures i'm meditating i'm praying over scriptures i'm writing scriptures with my with my hand i write scriptures with my hand and uh, when a friday comes usually my speaking ministry start from friday and goes right till sunday night i have a 3:30 today i have a 7 o'clock today to speak at and my heart is ready my heart is ready to release because right through the week i have spent time meditating thinking through praying over scripture and now it's ready for release and beloved uh, i hope when you come to the lord's house on a lord's day you are ready to release the word of god into someone else's life uh, yesterday at our membership class that's one of the things i taught i i, I said we strengthen one another by speaking the word of god into somebody's life so you could very boldly ask somebody so what did the lord say to you in your quiet time this last week and then uh, repeat the uh, reverse the role and 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 share with each other uh, what the lord meant to you over the past week what verse came alive to you from scripture and uh, some of you send me emails and say this verse came alive to me that's excellent i know you're in the word then and would really encourage you to do that scripture joy number 6 <coughs> we turn to psalm 126 and i want to call this soul winners joy soul winners joy psalm 126 very often used at missions conferences and evangelism courses psalm 126 the people of god who were in exile they are coming back home that's the context of the psalm so verse 5 those who sow in tears will reap with joy he who goes out weeping carrying seed to sow will return with songs of joy carrying sheaves with him what does that mean what this simply means is i go with a broken heart to people for evangelism to be successful we need to have a broken heart it's not all the formulas it's not all the techniques the the key ingredient to evangelism is a broken heart and my goodness when i take my walks and i see the muslim people and the hindu people i just put my hands to my heart and say oh god in some way reach out to them lord break through to this dear lady with the burqa oh this young girl with the burqa oh lord break through to her break through to her lord they must hear the gospel lord in some way they must hear the good news of christ lord and uh, so you 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 begin to pray without even you realizing it it begins to happen and uh, a broken heart <laughs> you can't evangelize with a hard heart right a broken heart and then you got to take with you seed so what is the seed that you take the word of god so you're dropping seed into the hearts of people it could be just one scripture right or it could be a whole article as the spirit of god guides you and leads you you drop seeds into the hearts of people and you're trusting the holy spirit to bring about the germination and to bring about the conversion and the salvation you go with a broken heart you go with the word of god and you very compassionately drop it into the hearts of people into the thinking of people and here is the promise you are going to return with songs of joy every time you share the gospel with someone your joy is going to increase i can guarantee that i can guarantee that and god in his great mercy is going to give you fruit you are going to see people turn to the lord because of your witness because of your life so don't ever underestimate yourself don't say oh look at me all my weaknesses we all have weaknesses but with the power of god operating in our life and as we go with that broken heart and as we share the word of god we will come back with overflowing joy and uh, god is going to give us wonderful returns right soul winners joy and maybe you are not having joy today because you are not sharing the gospel you are not reaching out to people and this christmas season what a glorious opportunity to share the gospel 
The seven o'clock event is a seniors event where there are going to be over 300 people. Amazing. Out of the blues, the call came, will you come and share the Christmas story? So, so God will give you wide open doors of opportunity when you are faithful in the little, right? When you are faithful in the one-on-one, God will give you the big numbers where you can go and make a difference in the lives of people. Number seven, <laughs> number seven, uh, some of you may not like number seven, so you want me to skip it? Sarah, what do you say? Go for it? Go for it, right, Okay. Number seven is suffering joy. Suffering joy. So Acts 5.41. Acts 5.41. So uh, I'm going to read from the last part of verse 40. So the apostles have been imprisoned for sharing the gospel. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. And they gave them an order, don't speak again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Some of us would have said, hallelujah, there you go. The authorities are saying not to speak. Hey, but that is one area where we disobey. Because we come under a higher law, the law of God. But now watch verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, that's that's the Jewish Supreme Court, very sad because they had been beaten. Did I read wrong? Okay. Some are following, others are not. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They said, what a privilege to be flogged. Right? And their joy knew no bounds. So maybe for some of us, including me, we need a healthy dose of suffering to bring about an overflow of joy. You want me to pray for you over that? Okay, Sister Grace is vigorously shaking her head and saying, no, please don't pray for suffering. I have enough suffering. But you know, honestly, you you look at the persecuted church, they are the most joyful people on earth because of the high price they are paying for following the Lord Jesus Christ. We are so absorbed with our materialism, with all our stuff, with all our houses, with all our vehicles, with all our dogs, that uh, we have lost the joy. Right? So, suffering joy. (laughs) Now we are going to take it to another higher step. I'm not too sure that I should go ahead with this message. Because it's going to get tougher. So what do you think? I'm, I'm giving you the privilege. Go ahead. Vijayant, you said it? Right, okay. So, go ahead. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Corinthian church had made big promises to the Apostle Paul, but they didn't come through. So, they are like us. They are like me. Make promises, but we don't come through. So, Paul had to rebuke them. And he used the Macedonian churches, that's a collection of churches, to rebuke the Corinthian church. So that's the context. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 1 to 4. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, they are overflowing joy. Hey, that's a disconnect. That's a total disconnect from a human perspective. How can you have severe trial and overflowing joy? You know the answer? It's in verse 1. Tell me, what is the answer? Verse 1. The grace of God. Quite right. In their severe trial, God's grace was wonderfully sustaining them that their joy knew no bounds. Now watch what it says. And their extreme poverty. Now on the one hand there was a trial, severe trial. On the other hand there was extreme poverty. They didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. None of us are that destitute here this morning. Right? Our fridges are stocked with food and we have freezers in the basement. 
with food for 2017. How do I know that? Because I come and checked your freezers. That's why. Right? So, we don't know the meaning of this. Extreme poverty. Welled up in rich generosity. I mean, this is a, humanly speaking, this formula doesn't work from a worldly perspective. Doesn't work if not for the grace of God. Severe trial, extreme poverty, plus the grace of God equals overflowing joy and rich generosity. When you go home, you need to write that out as a formula in your journal. And that should be the reflection of your life and my life, right? Now, look at verse 3. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, they went the second mile, they went the third mile. The way I picture it is they said, uh, Paul, please uh, pass the collection plate. And so they took a collection and they said, Apostle Paul, please, can you pass it again a second time? So they took a second collection and then they said, please, Apostle Paul, can you pass it again the third time? So our brother Thomas would have a heart attack if he took three, three, uh, three collections on a single Sunday. Right, brother Thomas? In spite of all the help you have. That's the picture that comes into my mind. Keep sending the collection plate. Keep sending the collection plate. And they were just giving and giving and giving out of their poverty. So this is what we call sacrificing joy. The more we sacrifice, the more joyful we will become. I don't know about you, I struggle with selfishness. Man, there is so much of stuff. <laughs> and I want to just give it all away, release it all away. Then Satan speaks. Hey, you need to keep some for a rainy day. Right? But the Macedonian churches say, hey, God will take care of the rainy day. You give sacrificially. That's the challenge. And that brings about incredible joy. <coughs> now, number nine. Serving joy. Serving joy. So Psalm 110 and uh, verse 2 and if you read it from the NASB uh, this is how it would read. Psalm 100 and verse 2. Uh, worship the Lord with gladness. Now that word worship is interchangeable with the word serve. So in the NASB, that's how it is worded. Serve the Lord with gladness. To worship is to serve, to serve is to worship. Right? Now look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. Luke 10 and verse 17. We looked at this passage earlier, but we need to take another look at it. Luke 10 and verse 17. And it says in Luke ten seventeen. Okay, Luke ten so the seventy two returned with joy. They had been sent on a missions trip. Seventy two had been sent on a missions trip, and the Lord gave them very specific instructions. They were equipped. They were anointed. They were under authority, empowered. Now they are returning. How did they return? With joy. The more you serve the Lord, the more joyful you will become. The more you take on a spectator attitude, you know, I'll just watch what's happening from a distance, nothing will happen. <laughs> you lose whatever little joy you have. So, beloved, I really want to encourage you to get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Do something that you can do. God has gifted you. Right? God has gifted you. So as we are coming into a new year, uh, pray, Lord, what would you want me to do, Lord, in and through the local church? What would you want me to do? And God is going to show you. Because we have tons of needs in the local church. And we want everyone to step up to the plate and to be counted and to do their part and to do over and above their part. And you'll be the winner because you will be filled with joy, serving joy. You know, you can testify to it when you are tired and you just don't, you want to have, 
you want to take the day off and be at home. But instead, you hear of a need. And by faith, you go to that place and you minister. And when you come home, wow, you're all revved up. You're all on fire. You're full of joy. The tiredness is gone. I have experienced that multiple times in my life. You know, physically you're tired, you're worn, you just don't want to do anything, you want to sleep, but then you have to go and you have to minister and you become incredibly joyful because of the way the Lord used you to minister to someone. Serving joy. Now here is the capstone. <laughs> here is the crown, number 10. I, I reserved it for number 10, okay? The strength of joy. There is incredible strength in joy. And many of you know this scripture, Nehemiah 8.10, the last part of the verse. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right? So when you and I are filled with the joy of the Lord, we are going to receive amazing physical, mental, emotional strength to face whatever challenge that, that's going to come our way. So I have highlighted two uh, reasons why we need the joy of the Lord to be our strength. The first bullet, to fight temptation. To fight temptation. All of us face temptation in one form or the other. We all face temptation, right? So yesterday evening uh, uh, at the youth meeting, uh, after we finished, uh, this girl said, Pastor, do you want free... Uh, uh, what's the thing they give at McDonald's? Uh, the big one, the Whopper. Do you want a free Whopper? I said, uh, how do you get a free Whopper? She said, oh, you have to download the McDonald's app and you go to McDonald's and you show it and you get a free uh, Whopper. <laughs> then somebody said, oh, Pastor, you don't know, this girl has already had three Whoppers. So I said, how do you get three? Oh, I, I just use fake emails. Ah, that's cheating. I can't go that direction. I can't go that direction. That is a temptation. Who doesn't like a whopper? Old as I am, I like a whopper. 700 calories, but I'll still go for it. Aru. Right? But then there was the flip side. So I had to say no, and I had to run from temptation. I had to say, and I had to say shame on you. You just followed a Bible study. And how could you do that? <laughs> so I had to follow up on her to see whether she has repented and, and returned the two hamburgers to McDonald's, <laughs> to fight temptation. And we need the joy of the Lord to face trials, to face trials. I, 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 I hope I can sincerely say that you are going to live a trial-free life, but that would be a lie. All of us are going to have trials in one form or the other, right? But the joy of the Lord is there to strengthen us, to face whatever trial that comes our way. So we look this morning at joy and uh, 10 ways by which we can cultivate joy in our life. So I want you to process this sermon, work on it in a very practical way, and if you want to have some discussion on it, by all means do so, and uh, let's talk about it again. So let me pray. <clears throat> Lord, we confess we are starved for joy, and uh, the stuff of the world takes over. We are disappointed, we are disillusioned, we are disheartened. And then, Lord, there are the huge sorrows of life. And today we learned that you, Lord, are a supremely joyful being. And when we invite you into our life, we uh, receive triple joy. And I pray that every one of us, including me, will work on these ten areas so that we can increasingly become a joyful people and we can commend people to the Savior by our life and also by our words. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.